Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'd just like it to be noted, Becky, I'm bang on time. <laughs> right, welcome, everybody, to this Guiney Pathway Board educational event. It's been four years since we've last had a get-together, so it's brilliant to see so many people, and I think there'll be some more joining us shortly. Um, we've got a, quite a broad uh, program today, so I hope there's something for everybody here. And we're covering a variety of topics, such as cancer performance, the challenges that we all face across the region, some updates about molecular pathology, um, and we've also got some interesting talks on health inequalities and relevant areas to that in gynecological cancers, and a research update at the end. Um, in terms of housekeeping, no fire alarms are expected, but if there is an alarm goes off, we're to exit through the double doors at the back, and Jack, who's just bobbed out the door, will be leading us to freedom. Okay, so follow him. Toilets are outside and to the right, is that right? Um, and we have planned lunch break and a coffee break mid-afternoon, um, and hopefully we'll wrap up around 4.30. Okay, all right, thank you. So... I thought the best way, we thought the best way to kick off would be by a patient story. So I'm going to move on, I hope. And again, one sec, to Tracy. So hi, I'm Tracy and I'm a mum of three teenagers. I am a full-time worker in the HR department. And I was diagnosed with womb cancer, or also known as endometrial cancer, in 2021. I received quite um, a holistic um, methods to my womb cancer. So I originally started off with an operation, which is known as a radical hysterectomy. Um, that involved the removal of ovaries, womb cervix and the top of a centimetre of my vagina, including um, my lymph nodes from my groins. That went very well and was very successful, um, was a good six to eight weeks of recovery. Um, and then I had a small gap in between uh, before I started my chemotherapy. The chemotherapy went on for six months and was a three weekly um, visit. I had all the um, what people would class as the typical symptoms of chemotherapy. I would have uh, my treatment on a Thursday and then I would have medications to support me with any side effects. And I would be quite poorly for about four to five days. And then I would be great in between before going back in for further treatment. I lost my hair, um, but uh, for me personally, um, I embraced that and, and was able to um, go back to work and continue working and um, have meetings um, and, and generally lived life. I then had a four week gap from my chemotherapy on to um, pelvic radiotherapy. Um, that was a total of 23 sessions. And for me personally, um, I found that uh, the most difficult treatment. I found um, that the side effects I had from my chemotherapy were more persistent. So nausea um, was consistent throughout the 23 sessions. Um, and although you can receive medications for that, um, it was quite difficult to manage. Again, I worked throughout all of that treatment. And for me personally, as a mother, I felt um, that was my way of trying to be positive for not only myself, but for my children to show that there is a normality um, and that we can be positive through such treatments. So I did carry on working, but I did find that particular element of my treatment very, very tiring, probably more so than the chemotherapy. I then had a small break again before I um, went on to something called brachytherapy, which is um, a type of radiotherapy, but this one is internal. Um, that was only two sessions. 
treatment was pain free um, and I had no side effects from that. Um, I came across Lynch syndrome um, probably late on in my treatment in a sense that at the beginning um, of my treatments when I had the operation, a consultant did say to me that uh, would I consent to having some genetic testing completed on uh, the, the organs that had been removed, which I agreed. Um, and I was informed that if anything was found that I, I would be be told. Um, I never had any information, so I assumed that, that all was well. But actually, I've been very fortunate to um, be supporting Christy with some interviews um, with some doctors in respect of their specialisms. And one of those doctors did talk about Lynch syndrome and it was really informative to me. Um, and I understand that I have possibly been tested for that, but because I haven't heard anything um, that I don't or haven't shown any, anything positive has shown up. Um, however, um, I think going forward, I think it's something um, that having had radiotherapy where I've been informed that I could be a little bit more predisposed to bowel cancer. And the fact that I do have three children and I also have um, a history, a family history of um, cancer. Uh, both my parents have passed with cancer, one very, very young. Um, my sister, who is 10 years older than me, has had cancer twice. In fact, both were gynecological and now I've had gynecological. Um, it would be of interest to me as a parent going forward how I can collect more information and maybe get to a stage where I can discuss that with my children so that they can be informed for their future. Um, I have been asked by one of my daughters um, out of, of concern, would she now be affected with cancer, knowing my family history, knowing I lost a parent when I was seven to cancer um, and knowing that both me and my sister have had cancer. So it's clearly something that that is going to play on her mind. Um, you know, I have two girls and a boy and we know that cancer does not discriminate. Um, and so I would like more information about that so that I can support my children going forward, whether that be now or in 10 years time. For me personally, um, I still feel and even now after my treatment um, that gynecological cancer is still not spoken about or known about as much as possibly we think. I believe that we're all very aware of cervical cancer and, and the cervical testing. Um, but when it comes to ovarian cancer or womb cancer, um, I still feel that people find that quite hard to digest when you explain that you are a cancer survivor and that you've had womb cancer. Um, the information is still not there for people. Um, for myself personally, I class myself as extremely lucky. I had menopause quite early and therefore my particular cancer was picked up relatively early. I had a, a bleed and, and I made that call. However, when I reflect back and think of the younger me, in my 30s or even in my 40s when you have possibly regular periods or you might have the odd bleed in between it sort of worries me that I could have possibly missed a vital sign um, and I already reflect heavily I know that the July before I had a heavy bleed in the November I'd had some spotting but had, had ignored that not realizing it was anything to be concerned about and it was only till I had a further bleed and a significant bleed that I made that phone call and my cancer had travelled from my womb to my cervix so I do sometimes reflect if I'd have just made that call that two three months earlier could I have reduced the treatments I was on or or possibly not even had to have had some of the the treatments that I had but so I do feel uh, that there does need to be more education out there for men and for women, you know, those men that have women in their lives, their own daughters, their own wives, 
also need to be be informed uh, and have that information ready. So, yeah, I would like to see more about gynaecological cancers. We need to take away this embarrassment and stigma. Um, and I feel that that we are making waves now with prostate cancer. And I think we need to do more about gynaecological cancers. Thank you for listening to that. She made, Tracy makes some really good points, doesn't she, about taking away the stigma, increasing the public awareness of situations. Um, she's clearly a very brave woman who's been through most treatment modalities and can speak very eruditely about it all. And quite pertinently, she's raised the bludgeoning area of genetic pathology, which is up there and centre now and not just important for our cancer sufferers, but for their relatives, going future, for screening. And we have some very relevant talks on that today that I hope everybody finds useful. I just needed to mention there are some microphones around. So during the presentations, if you have any questions, uh, there will usually be time at the end for questions. But any burning questions, please pop your hand up and we'll get the microphones to you. So over to me now. So I thought this would be a perfect opportunity to talk a bit about cancer performance and the best practice time pathways. Um, most of us here are aware that one of the biggest anxieties to people diagnosed with cancer is the waiting. The waiting for their diagnosis, the waiting for their information, the waiting for their treatment to start. Um, and the best practice time pathways have been developed to try and improve the efficiency and quality of care um, equitably across all of the country, ultimately, by applying these guidances to how quickly we see and, and diagnose and treat people with cancer. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about the best practice time pathways and where are we now in GMEC. Well, before we can talk about that, we need to look back at the history and where did all of this start? In 2019, the NHS uh, published its long-term plan, which put cancer front and centre with a strong ambition to diagnose three quarters of cancers in early stage, stage one and two. So hopefully have better cure rates and treat people sooner. Around the same time, a task and finish group was set up looking about how can we develop these faster diagnoses, pathways and standards. In 2020, through Gynae Pathway Board, we ratified a GMEC Gynae Best Timed Pathways. And this actually started, the discussions around this started with my predecessor, Lisa, Lisa B, <laughs> the year before, and we all discussed it as a group of how should we approach developing our own best time pathways. And as I say, they were ratified in September 2020, but we all recognized these were aspirational. These were how we would envisage best time pathways working with the right resources, both staffing, equipment, uh, and, and estates. Um, Gynae Pathway Board asked all the local units to audit themselves, the Gynae Best Time, themselves against the Gynae Best Time Pathways. But as we'll all remember, this was during COVID time, and that clearly had a bit of an impact on the time people had to do. But in 2021, we did look at some audits through the Pathway Board, which I'll cover a bit later. NHS England needed to get on the act as well. And between 2020 and 2023, they developed, um, published papers about best practice time pathways, which embedded the faster diagnosis principles for several tumour groups. And the Gynae NHS England Best Practice Time Pathway was published in March 23. Seven tumour groups were, um, had papers published by NHS England describing what the faster diagnosis pathway should look like. The first two, colorectal and lung, had snazzy front covers with pictures. They got bored and they just used words. So I've glammed up Gynae with a green border so we stand out. And we were the last but one um, implementation paper that was published. So what did we develop in, through GMEC? This is an example of our endometrial best, pra, best time pathways. As I say, these are aspirational and what we were hoping for and, and, and setting the standard for was clarifying what the referral criteria should be for women with suspected endometrial cancers. The aim of was that we would see women ideally at a one-stop clinic by day seven of their pathway, 
have histological diagnosis by day 14, and in the majority of cases, get them to a treatment planning SMDT by day 21 of their pathway. But we recognised that some patients were more complex or needed GA but diagnostics, and we allowed for that in saying those patients may be, uh, the target would be a day 28 SMDT treatment planning meeting. Although the faster diagnosis standard hadn't been embedded by this point in NHS England, we were aware of it already, so that day 28 timed it, tied in with what was going to come as the faster diagnosis standard. We also included day 38 in our regional best time pathway because that's an important target for patients that need transferring to a tertiary unit for their treatment there. So day 38 is the target by which we need to transfer the care from local units with a cancer to tertiary care so women can achieve their day 62 treatment start target. We developed similar ones for cervical, vaginal and vulval cancers, which are essentially C by day seven in a gynae clinic, which is effectively a one-stop clinic because biopsies can be taken. Um, with regards to cervical cancer, we recognised PET CT scans was needed for many of them, but that in most cases it didn't alter treatment modality, so we were happy to discuss these women by day 21 in SMDT without the PET CT results. And the remainder of the targets are similar. We had another best time pathway for ovarian cancer. Um, again, the day seven target for first being seen or virtually reviewed. We didn't mandate there had to be a system for straight to CT testing because we felt it was quite difficult to mandate triaging. And if we were able to see women by day seven or assess them and could turn around the imaging quickly, we could still stick to our best time pathway uh, targets. Any questions about these before I move on? Because there's quite a bit of wording on here. No. Okay. So, as promised, we tried to audit ourselves. We recognised the best time pathways were aspirational. So what we wanted to do was audit ourselves to identify where we were doing really well already and where the pinch points were so we could target our resources at those areas and view what we would do. Now, only three units managed to uh, perform these audits and they were really time consuming. In Bolton, it took three days of cancer manager's time, two days of my time just to look through the data. And all of this is during COVID, COVID recovery with lots of other things going on. So not surprisingly, three units out of the 13 that fed into Pathway Board actually managed to audit it. Bolton's data is shown on this slide. Um, for the six or seven months that I, we audited in Bolton, what we found was that we were actually doing quite well for the day seven target, maybe a benefit of COVID actually, because other clinics were canceled. Um, but we were seeing up to 83% of women by day seven. But things start dropping off after that. Histology was available by day 14 in up to two thirds, and that was mainly cervical where they have the biopsy at the first visit. Um, we got about a fifth to a third through to SMDT by day 21 as we had hoped for, and between a third and all of the women to SMDT by day 28. But they seem to pick up again by the day 62, which is tantamount to how well we work across the region's team, locally and referring to tertiary units, with 100% of cervical being treated on time, but still not hitting our 85% target for the others, but this is where we're at in 2021. If we extrapolated this data to how many women would meet the faster diagnosis standard by day 28, 71% at this point would know whether they did or did not have cancer by day 28. So this was before it was even embedded as a target. This is where Bolton was at. And as we all know, there's a big pressure from women referred through on the cancer pathway who don't have cancer. And actually 92% of those women were removed from the cancer pathway by day 14. Becky Thompson did um, her audit in Mid-Cheshire, and these are her findings. They did a lot better, really, at the day seven uh, reviews with two-thirds to 100% being seen by day seven. But again, delays starting with um, diagnostics after that, and between a fifth and a third had histological diagnosis by uh, day 14, 
and a similar amount, about a quarter, got to SMDT by day 21. There were three of the cervical cancers, if I remember rightly, who hadn't even got to SMDT by day 28 because of delays around diagnostics and, and radiology. And as the comment there with ovary, there were some quite significant delays of over two weeks accessing radiology. And again, because of capacity, particularly with ovary, CT scan was the first line of investigation for COVID. And we were competing with COVID a lot at that point. I really apologize. I don't have Salford's data. I couldn't get it to hand, but Jim had audited Salford's and found broadly the same things as both Bolton and Mid Cheshire. But what we did is we surveyed our pathway board unit leads and asked them, what are the five biggest problems to uh, block us to the best time pathway? And the responses were shown on this slide and broadly similar. Capacity at the front end in clinics, staffing levels, particularly radiology and pathology. We've had national shortages in these areas. Um, Pet CT was a bit of a problem because it was delaying transfer of care because pet CTs were only done at Wigan and Christie and that was a couple of times this was flagged up as a problem. And sometimes the process itself was slowing down as being able to transfer care to the tertiary centres even though clinicians agreed there were blockers in place about diagnostic or accepting the transfer of care. Uh, and theatre capacity, you know, theatre capacity dropped right off during COVID, and then there's been huge recovery issues. NHS England published its implementing the best practice time pathways for gynae in 2023, and the main drivers are shown in the, the colourful bubbles. Suspected gynae cancer is the fifth most common cause of cancer refer suspected cancer referrals in England. Um, actually, gynae made up 9% of all suspected urgent uh, referrals in 2020. And in 2018, the data showed ovarian cancer performed particularly poorly with um, the longest waits between referral and treatment, ranging between day 59 to 88. And actually, the median treatment date start was around day 69 for this group. And prior to COVID, 70, only 72% of patients were hitting their day 62 target. And I say that with a little laugh because we're facing worse figures at the minute and we are post-COVID. This is a graph I lifted from the NHS paper that just shows the arrowed areas of the gynae cancers and it shows different tumour groups and the length of their pathways with different coloured blocks. The pale blue is from referral to first being seen. The deeper blue is first appointment to diagnostics and diagnosis. The pinky colour is from diagnosis to getting to MDT and the darker pink is from MDT treatment planning to starting treatment. The heavy arrow shows the ovarian pathway. And actually, as I've mentioned, the median time from referral to treatment start in this group was 69 days. And as we can see on that graph, there's around a three week wait between first appointment and completing diagnosis for this group. Cervical and uterine cancers perform a bit better. And I think for um, cervical cancer, the median time to treatment was 54 days and for uterine 59. I might have got that the wrong way around, but below day 62. But again, there's some delays there in the diagnostic phase. And in all of them, there's about a three to four week wait from MDT discussion to treatment. Um, so that's something to bear in mind, but understandable if many are going to tertiary units, are two tertiary units. So this is the best practice time pathway that NHS England came up with. They didn't uh, uh, doc put it per tumour site, but they did a generic pathway, uh, best practice time pathway. One of the key things we, they talk about is triaging your referrals by day three. I've highlighted with red rings or red lines the key areas to focus on in this busy slide. So triaging by day three was important to get the women to the right clinic, right test quickly. Straight to CT scan can be arranged for the query ovarian group, but it requires good clinical triaging. They also highlighted the importance of streamlining, finding out which cases can be managed by local MDTs, don't need to go to the specialist MDT or sector MDT for treatment planning to improve the throughput through the pathway. And they aimed for SMDT treatment planning by day 28. So 
maybe GM, GMEX best time pathway is a bit more aspirational, but they're, they're aiming for day 28, but they expect the PET CT to be reported by that point and involved in treatment planning. So a bit of differences, but a lot of similarities to, to our own best time pathways. This slide just highlights in red the, the key differences between the NHS England best practice time pathways and our GMEC best time pathways. Um, and I, I've mentioned these already. One of the things NHS England was clear about, though, was a minimum data set from primary care, which was a bit broader than we are used to, including information about medical health, clinical frailty score, issues that affect our diagnostics like claustrophobia, we can't get them to MR scan, all these things that help us speed things through quicker. Um, and I've mentioned PET-CT already. One of the strong points, I think, about our GMEC best time pathways is we've quite clearly laid out referral criteria to try and help our primary care colleagues, but there's a lot of work that's needed in that area. So how are we doing? Well, we all knew we had high aspirations. We weren't achieving the best time pathways already, but it was a starting point. And we all knew that there were barriers. Our barriers were as we expected. Um, and we, we hope to document that through uh, audit and, and surveys. We recognized COVID was a problem, but also a benefit for cancer, because it was COVID and cancer only for the first 12 months. That was all that got done in the, the NHS. Um, and we recognize we need good quality data to be able to improve our services. So with the help of Lorraine, thank you very much, we've pulled together some data from Tableau to look at what is our performance at the minute. This slide shows our day seven first appoint, uh, appointment performance, and it's only for May. So I thought we'd just look at day seven for one month to see if it was worth trying to get this data because it's quite difficult to pull. And as you can see from this slide, only 25% of people or women are seen by day seven with an urgent or suspected cancer gynae referral. The green bars show the women who are seen by day 14, which is the NHS target, but we've tried to get a tighter target and actually we're only hitting 25%. So poorer than the audits that I've just discussed. And maybe that's not surprising. We are now in COVID. We have a three-year backlog. We have competing NHS targets for recovering our backlogs. And we still have staffing issues across many areas. So we've pulled together some data looking at the two-week work referrals to first appointment by GM standards, Greater Manchester units, and also Cheshire and Merseyside units, because Mid and East Cheshire are part of our GMEC group. Okay, so I've Presented, we've presented all of this here. The graph on the left shows the um, GM performance, the graph on the right, the Cheshire and Merseyside, and the green is the number of proportion of people seen by day 14 from their first appointment. And generally, East, um, East Cheshire and Merseyside are doing a little bit better, but not much in it really overall. There's still, I'm not sure we're hitting our targets of 93% uh, to be seen by day 14. This slide breaks it down by units across GMEC. And we can see here only one unit, Stockport, is actually meeting that target of 93%. Two units just missed that target. They're within 5% of that, and that's East Cheshire and Mid Cheshire. And I think that was 89% and 91% seen by the day 14. If we look at the faster diagnosis standard, this is set at 75%. Again, GMEC uh, uh, performance on the left, Cheshire and Merseyside on the right, and none of them are really reaching 75%, and they're quite similar. Broken down by unit, again, we can only see one with a green smiley face is hitting the 75% target, and that's Wigan. Bolton comes in a close, a close uh, 70%, I think. We also measure our standards against 31 day from decision to treat to first treatment. And the national target for this is 96%. We perform much better across the region in this, in this metric. And six units hit that target comfortably. Two units just miss, um, just miss that one. And I think that's Wigan and Northern Care Alliance. MFT's data is a lot lower. It's, it hits a target of 79% for this metric, but I'm not sure if this is influenced by Hive, 
um, the transition to Hive, which meant there was some data collection issues. But from what I understand from BI and Lorraine reviewing it, we're reassured we've captured all that data, um, but we can confirm, confirm that later. If we look at the different treatment modalities, uh, just to get an idea, this data is just for April. And it shows that the day 31 decision to treat to whatever treatment modality is 100% for April. So it won't be this good every month, but that's pretty impressive. And the biggie, day 62 target. This varies from how women get to us. Are they referred by an urgent two-week wait pathway or are they an upgrade? They either come through A&E or are upgraded by consultant through clinic. And this graph here shows the GM performance with the two-week wait referrals from the GP on the left and the consultant upgrades on the right. And maybe not surprisingly, the consultant upgrades uh, perform a bit better because if they come through A&E, often inpatient diagnostics are much quicker. And this slide shows the day 62 target for the, the same metrics for Cheshire and Merseyside. And again, upgrades perform a bit better, but Cheshire and Merseyside on these graphs seem to be performing a little bit um, worse than GM. But more importantly to us, how do we break this down by unit? And this shows the bar chart of the two-week wait referral targets meeting treatment by 62 days in 85% for the units across GMEC, and none of us are hitting that target. In fact, Christie's comes the closest um, at 82%, but no unit is hitting this for the urgent suspected cancer referrals. A little bit better for the upgrades. Two units are hitting this target here, um, Bolton, Christie and Wigan and Bolton come in close at 80%. But as you see, we're all, in the many units are struggling to hit this target now. So in a nutshell, only one trust achieved the uh, two week wait target of being seen by day 14. Two were close within 5%. Only one trust across GMEC achieved the faster diagnosis standard. Uh, six trusts do meet the 31 day decision to treatment start standard, so that, that's good, but none are achieving the day 62 target to for referral to first day of treatment. Upgrades perform better than the GP urgent suspected cancer referrals. So what are the issues? I think we've spoken about these, and most people already know this in the room. The referral rates have gone up dramatically. This chart shows the GM uh, suspected cancer referral rates for gynae on the left, and Cheshire and Merseyside on the right. And it looks certainly much steeper to my naked eye for Cheshire and Merseyside. So you can see the increased pressures coming through the system with very little change in capacity over these years. The conversion rate, that means how many of these referrals actually found to have cancer has stayed stubbornly around three and a half percent over this whole time. So although the percentage has stayed the same, that does mean the numbers have gone up a little bit if we're seeing more. But, you know, there's a lot of effort to get the same percentage of people being diagnosed with cancer. We've all commented and felt about quality of referrals or the difficulties GPs face in working out who needs to come urgently and not. Added to that, the primary care colleagues are facing the problems of waiting 52 weeks for a routine referral compared to trying and getting people through more quickly on the two-week wait pathway, which opens up that referral system to being, I don't want to say abused because I feel sorry for the GPs and the women waiting to be seen, but it's not used in the right sense then. So certainly, I think most of us, we've, tri we've audited our inappropriate two-week wait referrals and found ovarian and cervical are particularly poor performing uh, referrals. We also have identified that the ultrasound uh, quality and capacity in the community is a problem. So we're often having to repeat the scans in secondary care to get useful information to help guide us, but it's also resulting in a lot of two-week wait referrals that are not appropriate. Capacity at the front end, we are struggling in secondary care to have enough clinic space. We're looking at virtual versus face-to-face. -face. Most gynae referrals need face-to-face. So I, I don't see how virtual is really going to help us, except the straight test for CT with ovarian. 
We know about turnaround issues for radiology. This is down to capacity, staffing, number of uh, machines. We, I think we have, is it the fewest number of CT scans per head across the whole of Europe, even though we have a developed health service. So we've got competing demands on the same resources. And similarly, turnaround issues for pathology, mainly around staffing numbers. Um, not all our units have gynae accredited pathologists serving the, their pathway boards, uh, their SMDTs, so they have to have their pathology completed at other units, and that may affect the pathway time. And of course, we've been competing with COVID and the COVID recovery targets, as well as cancer targets throughout these three years. So what next? Well, clearly, we need to be data-driven. We need to know where the pinch necks are so that we can um, pinch points are so we can plan what we need to do next. And we need help from BI. And we've got Karen Hodgson here who's going to talk a bit about the faster diagnosis pathways and how BI can help us improve things, get the right data. Um, diagnostic capacity and support for primary care referrals is really key as well. Uh, and there have been works going on to try and improve uh, the support for primary care. We've had cervical uh, assessment training and the atlases have been pursued for all primary care um, clinics so they can hopefully refer the right query cervical cancers in. But also there's work going on to see how we can develop algorithms for referrals and improve quality of community scans by embedding the IOTA system to assess ovarian cysts. So there's a lot of fingers in different pies. We're hoping to improve this, but it's a big job. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Karen Hodgson. I'm a project manager at GM Cancer, um, working with the fast, on the FAST Diagnosis project. Um, so we're part of the performance team um, within um, Greater Manchester Cancer. <laughs> okay, um, so just a, a word about what we're doing. Um, so the planning guidance measures for this year um, are around operational performance, are about achieving FDS. It's very much a theme from NHS England that FDS is, is a key, key target for us. Um, and also uh, the backlogs, um, obviously, that we developed through COVID is to try and get those down. Patients waiting over 62 days. Um, and specifically, we're being measured on the best practice time pathways for prostate, lower GI, skin and breast. Um, so although that doesn't include gynae, it's very much a local focus uh, for us because um, at the moment, uh, our national data in April, um, gynae cancers were only achieving 57%. For, tw for achieving 28 days for uh, a patient being told whether they've got cancer or not. Um, and that's one of the lowest of the tumour sites that we, we, we have across Greater Manchester. So we've got a local focus on that. And it's becoming clear as well from our um, last meeting with NHSE that they're also seeing that replicated across the country that everyone is struggling with getting the gynae patients um, through the pathway. So we're, we're working with um, the pathway boards closely, um, but we've also got links into all the other Cancer Alliance work streams. So we're working with the early diagnosis team to look at, as Nadia said, what can we do pre-referral to get the right people coming in? Um, and also we've got close links with the cancer manager teams as well. Um, so. My, the faster diagnosis team, myself and Sue Sykes, who's the program lead, um, are working across across the patch. Um, so what we've been doing is, and it might be something we could do um, with the gynae team, is to uh, do a, a workshop. So we can take, for instance, your suggestion that we can see uh, Stockport doing better on seven days and we can sit around the table and say well what are your processes how does that work so uh, maybe that's something we could consider doing going forward and it's good to get you know the CNS teams and the clinical teams to see what the differences are because it's those small gains you know we all know we've got problems with diagnostics etc so is there something little in the processes we can do as um, 
they were saying over there that you know triage every day by the CNS might help, etc. So can can we look at those small wins across the patch um, to improve everybody's performance and and to ensure patients coming into Greater Manchester are getting equitable treatment? So. Nadia asked me to look at some of the data around diagnostics, and that's pretty difficult to do, um, and I'll go on to explain why. Um, so, but we did get some pet data um, from the pet team in the Christie. Um, I'd urge caution when you're looking at this, uh, because of, apparently there are quite small numbers of people going there. So if you've got one person who's waited for whatever reason, they couldn't make the first appointment or whatever, it's going to skew your data. So, But we do have access to um, the pet data. But I think what the message from me is, is not quite sure where I'm supposed to point this, but there you go, um, is that we need your help. Um, so, in, our BI team are very good, but they're only as good as the information we can get. And when we're looking at um, the pathways, obviously there's endometrial, etc. And so we, we'd like to look at it at subsite level, but that can only happen if you guys are putting that subsite data into your system. So your MDT coordinators and your booking teams uh, put in a subsite in. And as you can see, the latest data says that um, across GM, there's 61% of your gynae pathways have an unknown subsite. So it makes it difficult for us to be able to provide you with the robust data we need to be able to, to, work, uh, to look at that in detail. And then, um, why, again, radiology and pathology, we'd all like to be able to see exactly how long we're waiting for everything. And we do have a diagnostics feed uh, for radiology, but at the moment it's difficult to differentiate between investigations done on a cancer pathway and those done on a routine pathway. So at the moment, our BI team are working, working on that to try and get something. The other option we now have is that we've got a feed of everybody's Somerset data, or but that doesn't cover the Christie and MFT, but there's a feed around that, around investigations. But again, it's down to the data quality and the data completeness that we get from the trusts. So that's an ongoing work that we're doing within, um, within GM cancer and pathology that we don't have a feed on that at the moment. So um, like I say, we, so we'll, we're coming to you guys, really, to say, can you help us? Can you support us? We're conscious that we don't want to keep asking you to fill in questionnaires or feedback or whatever. So the more we can get automated, the better. So like I say, just asking for your support on that. And that's it, really. Like I say, we're, we're working with the teams um, and uh, we, if we've got any ideas for sharing best practice and how we can help you improve that's what we'd like to do. Questions from anyone? Comments? <laughs> just a comment, really. Um, I think this work is just at the start, and I think that it's, it's well recognised that we need good granular data, and we need a way of BI being able to pull together quickly reports for us to come through the Gynae Pathway Board quarterly. So that's the vision, um, that we'll have granular data down to trust level that will look at day seven first appointment, interval between requesting a by a histology or radiology to being done, being done to being reported, so we can really get down to see where we need to target resources. And um, we've had some meetings and more planned with Lisa Gallagher-Dawson for BI to see how we can move this forward. We had hoped to have Gynae up and running by July, not going to happen, um, but we are still plugging away. I think BI have got other targets they need to meet first, but we are pushing forward to hopefully get a BI-driven report that will come through Can Pathway Board, help us with these very questions. So just a comment, thanks. Okay, so we have made a little bit of time now and we're actually timetable for a bit of a break. Um, is that everybody like a comfort break, another coffee? 
toilets are directed down there. And we're going to restart with Emma Crosby at 11.15, please. <laughs>